but we've talked about children. As we look at adults, you know, deaths of despair was something we've talked about over the last few years that was already taking place throughout society. Overdosing, these, these kinds of problems were, ma- I mean, before we went into COVID, mental health was off the charts as a major concern for people. And then during COVID, I remember seeing at the end of the summer, these, uh, the data, I believe, from the CDC that talked about suicidal thoughts. And I think ages 18 to 24, 25% had suicidal thoughts. I mean, that's one out of four of our college students where at the end of that summer, they're, they're not seeing purpose and meaning. And I think that's what fear starts to do, right? It starts to creep in. And for our children, as they try to look to the future, the future all of a sudden feels so much more uncertain than at any point in our lifetime. Can, can you see why children have, have moved to this depressed place? Well, absolutely. I mean, I don't want to, you know, bring back all of the trauma for the audience members here. But I mean, the, the lockdown, you know, it was waking up every day to the same thing. It was not being able to look forward to getting together with your family, to going to church or synagogue on the weekends, to having family celebrations. There was, it felt like you never knew when things were gonna get back to normal and it was the same thing day in and day out. And that is the kind of thing that you know, leads people with perfectly good mental health to start to have these thoughts. But if you're already in a vulnerable state, if you've had addiction problems of some sort in the past, I mean, and now you can't have access to a meeting in person of people to support you, if you can't access professional services except over a computer, um, if you can't come together with your community, if you don't feel like you have those things to look forward to, you can really see why people who already had those problems fell back into those habits. Yeah, and you know, there's data that came out in 2019 that Barna did that describes how the church can play a role in this kind of moment. And I think for people listening today who are Christian leaders, they lead Christian communities, maybe they lead churches, or they're, they're leading social service organizations, there's the opportunity right now like there's never been to step in. And, and what's interesting about the data is it shows that our non-Christian neighbors when you ask them, what can the church do in your community? Like their first thing they talk about is child welfare, children after school, having something to do, having mentors, having a place to go. One of the second or third things after homelessness, that, that you know, solving the homelessness problem, the, the next practical thing that comes up is counseling, mental health counseling, um, sitting with the elderly so that they're not lonely or isolated. And so there's this perfect moment where the world sees it pretty clearly, practicing Christians are along those same lines, seeing it the exact same way. So what is the opportunity for churches where we're not relying on the government to solve all these problems, but churches can maybe play a role in helping heal right now. Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, I think one of the most urgent needs I see is in the world of foster care. And you actually had some great organizations that learned to do training over Zoom this year. Um, but obviously, you can't Zoom foster parent. And they saw, some, some of these places actually saw a big increase in the number of volunteers. People who were suddenly found that they were working from home more often, that they had more flexibility in their schedule, were able to take in children when they couldn't before. So there, there are are some, you know, positive stories that have come out of this year, and a lot of those positive stories have come out of the church, frankly. 